In this video, we'll be talking about the female reproductive anatomy and also how it functions, physiology. Before we move on from this intro slide, I want to point out um, this organ right here. This one I'm circling. This is the uterus. That's where the baby is going to develop up until birth. Down here, right below it, that is the urinary bladder. So this is the reason why, as a woman progresses in her pregnancy, it becomes harder and harder for her to hold her pee for very long. She may have accidents because that baby up there is getting bigger and it pushes on the bladder. And sometimes it kicks the bladder as it's inside, which can then lead to more pressure and have difficulty then holding urine. So incontinence is not an uncommon thing um, during pregnancy. So these big folds of skin, there are um, inner ones and outer ones. Those are the labia. Um, L-A-B-I-A. -A. Labia is a Latin word that translates to, to lips because it looks like a mouth from the side with lips. Um, there's the majora and the minora. We'll just call them the labia collectively. Um, so the folds of skin before the entrance into the vagina. So here is the entrance into the vagina, the um, orifice there. Up here is a separate opening. That's the entrance to the urethra. That's where urine comes out. Um, some women I found do not actually know there's two different openings, the urethra opening first and then further back there, the vagina. And up here we have the clitoris. The clitoris is the female equivalent of the penis, or I guess you could say the penis is the male equivalent of the clitoris. Um, so the clitoris responds in similar ways. When aroused, it becomes engorged, so it fills up with blood. swells up. Um, it's very, very sensitive. There are more nerve endings in the clitoris than there are in the entire penis. And this is why for females to achieve uh, orgasm, climax, whatever you want to call it, um, most females require stimulation of the clitoris um, because the vagina, although it does have some nerve endings, most of those nerve endings are only within the first inch or two of the vagina, and there are far fewer of them compared to the clitoris. So um, that stimulation is required sometimes for, um, like I said, orgasm. Here's another summary slide here of the male versus the, uh, sorry, the internal female anatomy. Um, you can come back and refer to this as we go through things. So here we'll go through step by step the different parts. So the ovaries. The ovaries are where the eggs are made before birth, um, immature eggs before birth. And this is also the location from where they get released, but they only begin getting released at puberty, and that continues then until the end of menopause. So unlike males that produce sperm um, from puberty until the end of their life, females have a defined end point, the end of menopause. We have the fallopian tubes. Fallopian tubes have other names as well. You'll also hear them called the oviducts or the uterine tubes. All these mean the same thing. And these tubes are going to transport that released egg down towards the uterus. This is also the site of fertilization. The vast majority of the time, this is where the sperm have to swim up into to encounter that ova, that egg, and fertilize it. Next, the uterus. The uterus is where that embryo will attach itself, will implant, will burrow into the lining of that uterus and stay there and continue to grow until um, delivery. The cervix, it's important to note, this is part of the uterus. It's not its own separate organ. So it's the lower part of the uterus. It's ring-like or circular and it produces mucus. The mucus it produces regulates the passage of sperm and other things through that area. It helps to keep the baby in the um, uterus until delivery time and it also has to then dilate and um, efface prior to delivery. The mucus it produces during pregnancy is very, very thick and it creates a plug 
to help prevent bacteria or other things from being able to get up into the rest of the uterus. And lastly, the vagina. The vagina, of course, is where intercourse can occur, and it is also the birth canal where the baby is passing through, unless a C-section is done, which we'll talk about later. So we said the egg, an ovum, is a female gamete, also made by division of a body cell. This happens inside the ovaries, and the name for this process is oogenesis. Uh, oogenesis is the name for the development of a mature egg called an ovum that has half the DNA, so that when sperm and egg come together, now you have those 46. A woman is born, actually before she's even born, she has all of the immature eggs, that's what these primary oocytes are, you can think of them as immature eggs. Oops. She has all the immature eggs she'll ever have prior to birth. And then they're paused in meiosis, the splitting process, until later on. These primary oocytes, these immature eggs, will begin to get released as they mature um, during the menstrual cycle that starts at puberty. And we'll talk about this, this cycle, which occurs um, over and over again up until the end of menopause. And it's approximately 28 days long. That can vary. Um, it does vary often from one woman to the next and then from month to month. So again, we call this the menstrual cycle. There's a video here that I have a link to um, that you can take a look at that does a good job of explaining this further but we'll go through it in a bit of detail. So the first day of your menstrual cycle is the start of your, menstru your menstruation, your period. And then um, shortly after that, inside your ovaries, an egg is starting to get ready to be um, released. The lining of your uterus starts to thicken. That's called the endometrium. And we'll go through and talk about this in detail, so don't worry. And then ovulation happens. The egg gets released. Um, the lining of the uterus continues to prepare and thicken. Um, egg moves from the ovary into the fallopian tube into the uterus. If it gets fertilized and implants, pregnancy occurs. If not, that lining of the uterus begins to break down, that thickened lining, and then menstruation happens where that thickened lining gets shed out through the vagina. So here's another one of this step by, we'll go through it step by step, the entire process of the menstrual cycle. So like I said, the start of it typically is measured by or denoted by the first day of a woman's menstruation or period. Usually, once per month at puberty, one, possibly more, but not often, a single primary oocyte, immature egg, will begin to develop further. And so that's regulated by your brain. Your brain secretes a hormone. You do not need to know the name of this hormone uh, for this class, but it secretes a hormone that causes an egg to mature. An egg matures inside of a structure called a follicle. Follicles are developing within the ovary. The follicle itself begins to secrete a different hormone, estrogen. Estrogen goes to the uterus and tells the uterus, hey, get ready, you may have a tenant pretty soon. So the inner lining of the uterus, called the endometrium, begins to thicken. And it does that to prepare for possible implantation if that egg gets fertilized and becomes an embryo. It needs to be ready for it burrowing in there and attaching. So the brain releases a hormone, tells your ovary to get an egg ready inside a follicle. The follicle then secretes the hormone estrogen, tells the uterus to get ready by thickening its lining of the endometrium. Next, ovulation happens about halfway through the cycle, although that's not exact. Only later on, if that egg meets sperm, will the process of meiosis finally finish and that mature egg will actually be formed. So we'll watch this short video here talking about this process and then continue on. Ovulation is the release of an egg from one of the ovaries. It often happens about midway through the menstrual cycle, although the exact timing may vary. 
In preparation for ovulation, the lining of the uterus or endometrium thickens. The pituitary gland in the brain stimulates one of the ovaries to release an egg. The wall of the ovarian follicle ruptures at the surface of the ovary. The egg is released. Finger-like structures called fimbrae sweep the egg into the neighboring fallopian tube. The egg travels through the fallopian tube, propelled in part by contractions in the fallopian tube walls. Here in the fallopian tube, the egg may be fertilized by a sperm. If the egg is fertilized, the egg and sperm unite to form a one-celled entity called a zygote. As the zygote travels down the fallopian tube toward the uterus, it begins dividing rapidly to form a cluster of cells resembling a tiny raspberry. When the zygote reaches the uterus, it implants in the lining of the uterus, and pregnancy begins. If the egg isn't fertilized, it's simply reabsorbed by the body, perhaps before it even reaches the uterus. About two weeks later, the lining of the uterus sheds through the vagina. This is known as menstruation. Ovulate. So in this, oops, sorry, um, series of images here, we're seeing the actual process of ovulation occurring. This was captured um, sort of by chance when I went in to do a surgical procedure in a, a woman. And you can see here that we have this follicle, this structure developing inside the ovary where an egg is maturing and getting ready to get released. Ovulation is when the egg actually gets released out into the fallopian tube. So, like I said, about midway through, ovulation happens, the egg is released. The follicle that's in the ovary where that egg was developing doesn't just go away instantly. Instead, the remnants of it, what's left over, becomes a structure called the corpus luteum. This little cartoon down here, I think, does an excellent job of summarizing what the, the main steps here are. So the corpus luteum secretes a different hormone called progesterone. Progesterone causes the lining of the uterus to continue to get thicker and also to be maintained, again, um, assuming that the egg was fertilized and an embryo um, has been formed. If the egg was not fertilized, that corpus luteum will break down, will go away, um, become a little scar eventually on the um, ovary, and then the menstrual cycle will begin again with menstruation, that thickened lining of the uterus being shed. So as we have here, if no fertilization occurs, menstruation happens. The thickened lining, that's called the endometrium, is shed. If fertilization does occur, the embryo implants. It burrows into the lining of the um, uterus. Corpus luteum stays around for a little bit longer, and that thickened lining, that thickened endometrium, stays. So let's look at it through this cartoon, and then we'll continue on here. So down here, we've got the brain secretes a hormone that tells a follicle to start to develop with an egg maturing inside of it in an ovary. As that follicle develops and the egg develops, it begins to secrete estrogen. Estrogen goes to the uterus and tells it to get thicker in response um, to prepare for the for prepare for possible implantation. Then we have um, a different hormone secreted by the brain that causes ovulation, causes the egg to get released. Um, the egg is released, the leftover remnants of that follicle form the corpus luteum. Corpus luteum secretes progesterone that tells the lining of the uterus to continue to thicken and stay there, and then um, depends on whether or not implantation happens, if that thickened lining the endometrium is maintained or gets released in um, menstruation, menses. So here is taking a look at um, a couple terms we want to come together with. So we said egg and sperm, those are the female and the male gametes respectively. They come together in a process known as fertilization to form what we call a fertilized egg. The term we'll use is a zygote. A zygote is a fertilized egg 
was formed right after egg and sperm come together. Other terms here talk about how many copies of chromosomes there are. Haploid means there's one copy of each chromosome. In humans, that means there's 23 chromosomes. After fertilization, now it's diploid. 46 chromosomes, the normal copy, two copies of each, 23 plus 23. And over here, remember that to make these sex cells, you're taking a body cell with 46 and you're cutting it in half. So to make a sperm cell or an egg cell, it only has 23 to come together in fertilization to form that diploid zygote with now the normal 46. We're going to watch another video here talking about the fertilization process, and we'll continue on. Fertilization is the epic story of a single sperm facing incredible odds to unite with an egg and form a new human life. It is the story of all of us. During sexual intercourse, about 300 million sperm enter the vagina. Soon afterward, millions of them will either flow out of the vagina or die in its acidic environment. However, many survive because of the protective elements provided in the fluid surrounding them. Next, the sperm must pass through the cervix, an opening into the uterus. Usually, it remains tightly closed, but here the cervix is open for a few days while the woman ovulates. The sperm swim through the cervical mucus, which is thinned to a more watery consistency for easier passage. Once inside the cervix, the sperm continue swimming toward the uterus, though millions will die trying to make it through the mucus. Some sperm remain behind, caught in the folds of the cervix, but they may later continue the journey as a backup to the first group. Inside the uterus, muscular uterine contractions assist the sperm on their journey toward the egg. However, resident cells from the woman's immune system mistaking the sperm for foreign invaders, destroy thousands more. Next, half the sperm head for the empty fallopian tube, while the other half swim toward the tube containing the unfertilized egg. Now, only a few thousand remain. Inside the fallopian tube, tiny cilia push the egg toward the uterus. To continue, the sperm must surge against this motion to reach the egg. Some sperm get trapped in the cilia and die. During this part of the journey, chemicals in the reproductive tract cause the membranes covering the heads of the sperm to change. As a result, the sperm become hyperactive, swimming harder and faster toward their destination. At long last, the sperm reach the egg. Only a few dozen of the original 300 million sperm remain. The egg is covered with a layer of cells called the corona radiata. The sperm must push through this layer to reach the outer layer of the egg, the zona pellucida. When sperm reach the zona pellucida, they attach to specialized sperm receptors on the surface, which triggers their acrosomes to release digestive enzymes enabling the sperm to burrow into the layer. Inside the zona pellucida is a narrow, fluid-filled space just outside the egg cell membrane. The first sperm to make contact will fertilize the egg. After a perilous journey and against incredible odds, a single sperm attaches to the egg cell membrane. Within a few minutes, their outer membranes fuse and the egg pulls the sperm inside. This event causes changes in the egg membrane that prevent other sperm from attaching to it. Next, the egg releases chemicals that push other sperm away from the egg and create an impenetrable fertilization membrane. As the reaction spreads outward, the zona pellucida hardens, trapping any sperm unlucky enough to be caught inside. 
outside the egg, sperm are no longer able to attach to the zona pellucida. Meanwhile, inside the egg, the tightly packed male genetic material spreads out. A new membrane forms around the genetic material, creating the male pronucleus. Inside, the genetic material reforms into 23 chromosomes. The female genetic material, awakened by the fusion of the sperm with the egg, finishes dividing, resulting in the female pronucleus, which also contains 23 chromosomes. As the male and female pronuclei form, spiderweb-like threads, called microtubules, pull them toward each other. The two sets of chromosomes join together, completing the process of fertilization. At this moment, a unique genetic code arises, instantly determining gender, hair color, eye color, and hundreds of other characteristics. This new single cell, the zygote, is the beginning of a new human being. And now the cilia in the fallopian tube gently sweep the zygote toward the uterus, where he or she will implant in the rich uterine lining, growing and maturing for the next nine months until ready for birth. So now that you've seen that video, let's talk about some less common results of um, this process, and that would be the formation of twins. There are two main types of twins, non-identical twins, which are also referred to sometimes as fraternal twins, and identical twins. With non-identical twins, the embryos that result in the eventual babies are no more alike or no more different than any two siblings that were born at different times. Because to make non-identical twins, you have two different sperm and two different eggs. So you'd have for a brother, sister, brother, brother, sister, sister that are born at different times. For identical twins, you have one egg and one sperm. Normally, when that zygote is formed, it starts to divide quickly into a ball of cells, and all those cells stay together. But for some reason, either that zygote splits into two, or later on, um, a group of those cells splits, and it forms into two embryos, but they're genetically identical because they had an identical sperm and egg in the beginning. So identical twins have the exact same DNA, but non-identical have different DNA from different sperm and different eggs being fertilized. Here's a quick question. If you can go ahead and pause the video, read through it, come up with an answer, then we'll talk about it. Okay, so for this one, I was talking about the different characteristics that describe the cervix during pregnancy. So these are some things I had talked about. And so during pregnancy, the cervix helps to keep the baby in there until it dilates wide enough to allow then for the pushing to occur, the contractions that push that baby out. Uh, it must dilate prior to, to delivery, that's correct. <clears throat> There's a mucus plug present, so nothing can get back up inside the upper parts of the uterus. And the mucus though is thicker, not thinner. Thinner mucus is produced during um, a right around ovulation to allow the sperm to pass through there, but thicker mucus during pregnancy. If there's another question, go ahead, pause the video, read through it, and we'll talk about the um, answers. So this question's asking, uh, why does menstruation happen? So what do you think? So it happens because that if implantation does not occur, that corpus luteum degenerates. It breaks down, and you no longer have the hormones being released that were telling that endometrium, that thickened lining of the uterus, to stay there. And so instead, it gets released and shed through the vagina. <clears throat> Up here, the uterine lining does not need to re be replaced monthly to keep it healthy. Think about before a female hits puberty or after menopause. The uterus is still healthy, but the lining is not being shed, so there's nothing to do with the health of the uterus. 
Um, menstruation coincides with the release of egg from an ovary? No. Um, the ovary begins to develop an egg inside of it during menstruation, but the release happens after menstruation. And extra blood cells are not grown, cells are not grown in the vagina, instead they're grown in the uterus and get shed. So here's another video for us to watch. This one's a little bit more edgy, so um, don't watch any children around. It's time for another episode of the G Spot. Where your genitals tell it like it is. Today's show, how do women get pregnant? You probably think pregnancy happens when semen or pre-ejaculate gets into the vagina. But what happens after that is where there seems to be some confusion. It doesn't matter if you're on a chair or on a bed. Uh, on your feet or, or on your head. If it's your first time or your last. On a box or with a fox. If you're in a hot tub, if you douche afterwards, if you're bungee jumping, whether or not she has an orgasm. Or, 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 or in an airplane bathroom or like a beach in Spain. Now calm yes. down. He, Peter, calm down. Oh. Sorry, I, I get a little excited. Oh, which uh, brings up another point. Even if a man pulls out before he ejaculates, a woman can still get pregnant. <clears throat> See? When we get all worked up, we squirt out a little bit of pre-ejaculate. Which can be enough to get a girl pregnant. And believe it or not, old Peter here doesn't even need to make it inside. <laughs> Say it ain't so. It's true. If semen gets anywhere on the vulva, even outside the vagina, the sperm can travel inside and get a woman pregnant. Whew. I better be careful with this stuff, huh? Could you throw that away already? <whistles> Lovely. So what happens then? Time to go inside and find out. Inside the vagina? <laughs> Calm down, Pete. You're leaking again. <sighs> We're using the vagina can. Oh. Hey, it's still pretty cool, huh? You might think that pregnancy happens right after sex. I know, Peter, that's not true. And if you use that buzzer again, I'm getting a catheter. Buzzer's gone. Thank you. As I was saying, pregnancy doesn't happen right away. The semen forms a pool in the vagina near the cervix. It's called the seminal pool. It's an indentation in the vaginal wall just below the uterus. Standing up won't empty the pool, and douching might actually push the semen into the uterus. Ah, the seminal pool. Sperm lounging around, waiting their turn to go. When they do go from the pool into the uterus, they go in waves. How long does it take to get pregnant? It could take up to six days to just fertilize an egg, and another six days to implant itself. But up to six days afterwards, the sperm can leave the pool and head on up through the uterus and into the fallopian tubes. Finally, they arrive. They hang out, they wait for an egg. If a woman is ovulating, an egg descends into the fallopian tube. If there are sperm waiting there, according to new research, the egg then decides which sperm gets to enter and fertilize it. Go! And now she's pregnant, right? Cut it out! <laughs> this is kind of fun. She's not pregnant yet. The sperm and the egg create a zygote, a one-celled combination of the sperm and the egg. Next, the zygote turns into a multi-celled pre-embryo. About four days later, it starts to implant itself into the wall of the uterus, which takes a couple more days. Pregnancy actually begins when the implanted pre-embryo starts releasing hormones that prevent menstruation. Which is why women miss their periods when they get pregnant, right? Exactly. Wow. Hey, I really learned something today. Well, don't think about it too hard, poor thing. You'll just give yourself a headache. No. Oh. That's it for tonight, folks. Hope to see you again soon right here at the G-Spot. Hey, you know, uh, Mina, all that talk, you know, really got me going. How about you? Uh? What doesn't get you going? All right, before we talk about this question here, I want to emphasize a few things from that video. One of the things they had mentioned was that Sperm can live up to six days under optimal conditions within the female reproductive tract. They also said that um, pre-ejaculate, which comes out before the semen containing sperm, can sometimes have small amounts of sperm come with it, which could be enough to lead to pregnancy. And then the third thing is that if ejaculation occurs on the labia, the clitoris, any of those external female um, reproductive structures, there's a possibility, however small, the sperm could actually swim inside and also lead to pregnancy. So three things that you want to kind of think about. 
So here's another question talking about um, identical twins. Let's take a minute to read through the options, relating it back now to two different terms we've introduced. All right, let's take a look at the answer and pause it if you haven't had a chance yet to um, answer this question. There we go. So each of those have to be haploid, having half as much DNA, 23 chromosomes each. So when they come together, we have a normal 46. <clears throat> So pregnancy is generally broken down into three trimesters, each one being approximately three months long. Different things happen in terms of development in each of the different trimesters. I won't test you on the specifics as to what's happening when, but if you're curious, you can look at, um, scan this QR code with your phone and uh, check out a video that's a pretty good one um, about the first trimester. Um, so I think there's three trimesters. You should know that much about this also know that a full-term pregnancy is considered to be between 39 weeks to just under 41 weeks. So we'll go right in the middle. We'll say that 40 weeks is a full-term pregnancy. Earlier than that is early term or premature, preterm. Um, then you have late term and post-term. Um, if a woman is healthy, you want to try to get to full term because even in those last few weeks, all the organs are developed, but there are important things happening inside um, the to the fetus inside the uterus. And it's been shown that helping to go until that 40 weeks at least, or full term, um, leads to much better results for the, the child. And if you go past that, there's really not a lot of risks um, unless the baby's getting too big or there's some kind of distress for the baby. If it poops while it's in the, um, the uterus, something called meconium that's made that can really get into the, the lungs and cause some, some problems, uh, or the baby gets too big to deliver. So there's some possible issues, but otherwise, if everything seems good, uh, the body normally has this way of kind of going on its own schedule. So here are the sort of basic phases of, of birth. You have contractions beginning in the uterus. The muscles of the uterus are contracting and pushing on that baby. As that baby gets pushed down, it causes the cervix to um, get pushed on and stretched a little bit. And the cervix starts to dilate, to, to open up, and also efface, to thin on both sides. And that will continue to occur until the cervix is dilated far enough. Usually like 9, 10 centimeters is um, sort of the area where they're comfortable saying, go ahead and push now. And then um, pushing along with the contractions of the uterus, getting stronger and faster, are going to push that baby then out through the vagina, the birth canal. You want to have the baby come out head first. Um, that makes for the easiest delivery, less complications. If it comes out in a different direction, that's referred to as breach position. You can have um, different types of breach position, feet first, uh, sideways, which is called transverse breach, you know, uh, a variety of different options, but head first is preferred. And the third step is after the baby comes out, the afterbirth, which is the placenta, is released along with the rest of the umbilical cord attached to the placenta. So I'll watch a video about this process as well. I found, you know, Baby Center is a really big resource for me, almost like a friend. It follows me all the way clear back through preconception, pregnancy, through delivery, through new mommyhood. In the weeks before birth, your body slows down production of the hormone progesterone while increasing production of other hormones, including prostaglandins, which soften the cervix, and oxytocin, which triggers the uterine muscles to contract. True labor contractions are rhythmic and painful and grow consistently stronger. As the long vertical muscle bands of the uterus tighten, they pull the cervix open. The strong muscles at the top of the uterus push down and release, guiding your baby toward the cervix. 
The mucus plug, a collection of thickened cervical mucus that sealed your cervix shut for nine months, may be expelled days before or in the midst of labor. When the amniotic sac ruptures, your water has broken. It can feel like a trickle or a gush of fluid. Your cervix will begin opening and thinning, known as dilation and effacement. Once you reach about four centimeters, your body will move into active labor. In active labor, contractions become stronger and closer together. At eight centimeters, you enter what many consider the most painful part of labor, transition. By 10 centimeters, you're fully dilated and may feel the urge to push. This is your signal that the second stage of labor has begun. Your baby will move down with each contraction. The three separate soft bones of his head will temporarily overlap so he can pass through the snug birth canal. Your baby's scalp will come into view. When the widest part of his head is visible, your baby is crowning. With several more pushes, your baby's face, shoulders, and body will emerge. In the third and final stage of labor, your placenta detaches and is expelled. With your baby's first breath, the incredible journey of birth is complete. So let's talk about births where a vaginal delivery does not occur. There are many different reasons for this. Um, the one that will, the process we're talking about is called a cesarean birth, often referred to as a C-section for, for short. And so with this type of delivery, there are kind of these three main steps here. Step one is you have an incision, a cut that's made through the abdomen and then through the uterus as well. Step two, the baby is very carefully, when the uterus is opened up, the baby is carefully being then removed. And additionally, besides the baby being removed, the placenta also needs to be removed. And then the mother is gonna be um, sutured or sewn back up. Um, this here is a link to a very useful uh, page talking more about C-sections, why they're done, some of the risks and other things associated with them. Um, I'd like you guys to go ahead and check that out, please. Um, use your phone, camera, and just scan that. If that doesn't work for you, um, I can provide a link also on Blackboard, so let me know if you have any trouble with that. But C-sections are done way more often than they need to be. Uh, you can see down here, it says the target range, according to the World Health Organization, is between 10 to 15 percent of deliveries are believed to actually need a cesarean section to um, either help save the life or, of the mother or the baby or to reduce their chance of um, harm. Um, some countries are underusing it, probably due to not enough access to that medical um, care. Others are overusing it for a variety of reasons. So you can see here, um, the national target that has been released for the United States is 23.9, which is still way higher than World Health Organization suggests. Um, but you can see that some of these um, states are even above that. So take DC, not a state, but um, district, uh, a little bit above that. Uh, Louisiana, 32. Florida, 31%, one out of every three almost of these states. Um, first time mothers are having C-sections, so very, very high. So what I would advise, if you find yourself pregnant, you're going into the hospital, um, make sure you have somebody there who can support you because a lot of times doctors might be pushy and try to get you to go into a c-section in some cases that's for your best interest but other times you know it might not be necessary so really think about that it takes a lot more to recover from a c-section than it does from a vaginal delivery and you'd be left with a major scar you know but in some cases it's needed right to make sure the baby and the mother are healthy uh, otherwise wouldn't be able to so um, kind of weigh the pros and cons there so take a minute, pause the video, um, read through this question, and see what you guys think the answer is. Okay, this is something that we had watched in that um, one video earlier in this topic. I also talked about it. So um, they are able to swim the sperm into the vagina if they get on the external female um, reproductive structures. All right, and that finishes up that topic.